It's Thursday, May 21st, 2015. I'm Jimmy Principe. And I'm Trey Comstock. Putting your final orders because this is Tech's Last Call, episode 116. Your last call for Tech News of the Week tonight. Jimmy runs with his Spotify down the municipal broadband. And I secure all the things against the five eyes of ICANN. Um, but we start... That's a disturbing image, isn't it? Uh, but we uh, start tonight with Spotify making all of the news. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this week, Spotify announced new enhancements to its music streaming service by adding things that are not music streaming. Um, the first update was a feature called Spotify Now, which provides curated you know, songs or beats music type playlists. Can I make Is- a sentence? Probably, um, I need which are sentence. easily accessible from the, quote, Now screen or, you know, like the home screen if you've ever heard of that um they also announced the addition of video and podcasts to the app ecosystem uh, including partners such as cnn for video uh for short blurbs and long blurbs and uh, twit and npr for podcasts uh both of these changes will come to all tiers of the spotify service including the ad supported tier now a new feature that was announced to probably try to enhance the value of the ten dollar per month feature or paid tier is something called spotify running now, Spotify should know that Americans don't run, but if you are among the Americans that do run... To Duncan. It <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. This will allow Spotify to integrate with the Nike Plus uh, ecosystem of, of devices and apps and RunKeeper to provide a curated playlist that will adapt to your pace and provide music that matches the beats per minute to help motivate you on your run. Uh, which is something that is really annoying if you're trying to actually build a playlist to do. So if it works, it could be really nice. Now, there will be six different running experiences at launch, including Burn and The Chase, and probably four other really dumb names. Um, Many have interpreted this as a preemptive move, all of these announcements, against uh, by Spotify before Apple's WWDC in June, where you know that fruit company is expected to unveil its own Spotify competitor under the Beats brand. So, Trey, did Spotify actually innovate in a market where differentiation is like not existent at all? I uh, sh- sure, yes. I didn't say whether or not that innovation was good. I just said, did they innovate? I mean, yes. The idea of a service with advertising and a subscription adding podcasts, which are normally free, is somewhat troubling, perhaps. Sure, more things, more places. I'm, we will apply to get on there as well. That could be well, interesting. And and the the analysis that I heard, and I, I can't claim anything on this, it's uh, Scott Johnson at the Frog Pants Network was saying that in general how these things work is probably going to be like Slinger uh, or Stitcher, where Stitcher, is, it's curated. So they have to ask you to be a part of their service. Um, but as part of that, when they ask you, you work out a deal for the advertising. So, for example, on Twit, they have advertisements yep, in, line. Um, in line with their podcasts. So presumably, if they're being hosted on um, Spotify, Spotify will either host additional ads against it or will get some of the revenue for whatever podcast, like it, some kind of revenue sharing thing yeah, for whatever podcasts or who, who knows what the details of it are. But um, where it could get dicey is if they start taking it, content that is free and has no ads, such as our podcast or the Daily Tech News Show, which is supported by um, Patreon.com, and taking that and then serving ads against it uh, and then without not giving them the money, and then not well, and not contacting them and working out with them a, a deal or having a standard deal like Apple's, we just take thirty percent, right? Um, I think that that's where it starts to get dicey as far as the podcasting element where, you know, and, and then you have this whole podcasting is not dead. Like it seemed to be five years ago. Right. When where CNET everything, pulled yeah. all of its podcasts, for instance, CNET just kind of went, well, this isn't going anywhere. And now and they've, they've, now that even they've brought some back, they added back a bunch of podcasts. Um, and that, that was partially to do with their combination of CNET and CNET UK. 
um, into one site. But I don't know. I, I think that the podcasting stuff is interesting. Um, I really think this is more of an ecosystem thing where uh, according to the the statement by the, the CEO of Spotify was – that people were leaving the Spotify experience for five to 10 minutes to go consume some other kind of content, usually uh, short form video and then yeah. come back to Spotify. And so Spotify's thing is, well, we should capture that ad revenue that they're getting going somewhere else. So, and just provide it all in app so that they don't have to go anywhere else. You know? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think what's so, most of this doesn't. Most of this music service stuff just, frankly, doesn't interest me. On a very personal level, I don't listen to a lot of music. I listen to spoken word content almost exclusively. And if I am listening to music, it's usually like a very specific, small subset playlist. of albums. Not even playlists. I don't even have like curated playlists. It just have I want to listen to this song by this person, and right. it's a very small subset. And I don't ever discover new music, and it's pretty much just the same basic set of things. I tend to like add one additional artist to this list for every stage of my life. Right. See, as, as opposed to where I I'm the one that consumes a lot of music, but I have found my happy place between. A service like Pandora, actually specifically Pandora, um, who at this point I have been using for eight years, um, actually almost nine years this year. Um, I've, I've used Pandora for almost its entire existence. I started using it in 2007. Um, and, you know, I use that service and it, it knows what I want and all of these things. And then when I want to listen to something very specific, it's something that I own. <laughs> Right, I do. I do pay for um, Xbox music, but Why? what I've just well, it came as it part came of the with work, the work and play bundle. It right. came with the work and play bundle. I got other things and that for free. It's basically I paid the the cost of Office three sixty five, which I was already paying for, and Xbox Live, which I was already paying for, and then I got Xbox music for free. So in in that kind of a, a value proposition, it made perfect sense. Um. However, all I've discovered about myself with both Google Music and, and Xbox Music is I don't listen to music I don't own. Right. I, like, or it's like two songs, and I'm willing to go to YouTube for that. Like, and it's just music is not, my, is not my social sphere. For some people, it's like, oh, have you heard this? Oh, I'm really into this person. And that's just not how I interact with humanity. I don't, I don't care. It's not that I you know, actively, you know, hate on people who that is a thing. It's just that experiencing music in that way is not my thing. I don't go to concerts. I don't, you know, this is just not my world. And so I look, I'm always kind of an outsider looking in at all these music services. I don't want any of them. My experience with Spotify, at least the free tier was that there were too many ads and they were a little, the, the inner, I didn't like the app um, situation. I'm, I'm a big fan of web apps. Um, sure. So Spotify force, yeah, Spotify forces me to download a thing, which some people like, um, but I personally can live without. I'd rather have a like with my with both Google Music and Xbox Music. They have a web interface that I can um, interact with to listen to my music. I think that's the right way to do it, and that also means for computers for which you don't have administrator rights. Well, exactly, your work computer. Like my work computer. And that's one of the reasons I listen to Pandora at work is because and – and I pay for Pandora 1. I pay the four bucks a month or whatever it is for Pandora 1. Um, so I honestly – I haven't listened to ads on Pandora since 2010. That's so true. Right. So you have no I've, idea I've how aggressive their advertising is. No, I have an idea because I always forgot to uh, update my payment information with them. I didn't have it set on the automatically charge me. I had it set on the make me press a button and pay you. Um, and then it would come to my, my day of, oh, now you need to pay for your Pandora 1. And I would just get ads all so over the place. and go, oh, God, what is happening? <laughs> there was no faster way for me to pay for my stuff. I think – so I look at the running thing, and I think that's the innovation, right? I that's think that's the interesting thing. Podcasting is – to me, it just seems like a strange mix. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. That just seems 
I feel like that's this is like a tab within iTunes kind of right. thing. Right. You know, there will be podcasts to be consumed. There will be blood. Yes. The running thing, if it works, that's awesome. If it can actually, you know, serve, I don't listen to music when I exercise either. So, theoretic, this is all like in theory based on things other people say. This is, a, <laughs> you know. I listen to audiobooks and podcasts when I'm working out. I don't need like that music to push me up that final hill. That's just not how I work. So, mm -hmm. let, but let's say I am that kind of person. If you could act accurately predict what kind of music I need, fantastic. I mean, that could be really cool. This kind of auto playlist, if it A, knows what I like well enough to serve up, you know, that I'm not going to get some cheesy thing that's going to make me go, I hate this. Well, if and I can get also can Pandora, predict the right pace of music. If I can get Pandora plus the, the pace stuff, then I'm, I'm in. But I've, in my experience, none of these services, even when I feed information into them like I do Pandora, none of them are able to capture my listening um, preferences as well as Pandora has. There's only one exception to that, and that is Google's um, – they have one playlist where they're like, "This is all music you will like." It's you basically will like this. it was called it was called something else, but it, it was basically a a playlist where they said, based on all of your listening history, this is what you will like. And sure enough, I liked all of, almost all the music on it. So Google, uh, I think Google has enough algorithmic power to make that kind of thing happen. Right. I don't know if Spotify does, and, and maybe they do. But I, I don't know. So if that feature pans out, I think, back to your original question, I think that is a meaningful innovation. I really do. Well, and, and the if other thing works. is, if it works, I'm it will skeptical. push people into the, um, the higher tier, See, I, I think. But no, because if you're already paying for the Nike Plus stuff yeah. and you're able to get something – because the way that I read um, – both their their announcement and the analysis of their announcement um, by like The Verge, for example, is that the Nike Plus app will be able to play music from Spotify directly. So okay. you yeah, don't have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can have that, Nike yeah, Plus that, yeah. open, and as long as you have them linked, it will play your Spotify content. Yeah, the same thing as the Starbucks great. thing we didn't talk about, right? So Spotify right. also inked a deal right. with Starbucks and a. The, End of last week or beginning of this week, and it blurs together. Which this is point. big. So much damn Spotify news for a service I don't use. It, it was uh, it was the beginning of this week. It was on Monday. So it's, so now every Starbucks barista is going to be a DJ, and so they'll each be given a Spotify account, and they'll set up a Spotify playlist for each individual store, and um, customers can vote and suggest songs to be played either through the Spotify app or through the Starbucks app, which is what what this twig for me i would find myself using that i am much more likely to be listening to ambient music in starbucks than i am to be listening to hard charging music while i'm running and that is partly because perhaps i spend more time in coffee shops than i do running which <laughs> my general physique may suggest like i said americans don't run so I, I literally medically can't run my knees just don't do that thing just fascinating. But all of this makes me think. So Spotify has an integration with Uber. So it can start playing in the car right as I'm getting in. It's right. an integration with Starbucks and an integration with running. If they can actually make their algorithms work, Spotify can just become the auto-populating soundtrack of your life. Right. So they know you're getting in an Uber at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. You know you're going to get into some things, and it can be your mix that starts high and keeps on rising. It keeps on rising. Right? It can know that you're in, uh, you're in Starbucks uh, during a work day, so maybe some Nora Jones is more your <laughs> speed right now. Um, or maybe, you know... Or maybe it, it's some Green Day. You know, we really clash. don't judge here. If you really need to stick it to the man, don't even go for the corporate ones. Go for the Sex Pistols and the Clash. I wrote a paper on them once. That was a great um, that was a great time researching and writing about punk rock. But again, if this algorithm works, that it can just go, oh, you're here, this is your activity level, I'm going to 
pump the jams. See, and then it'll integrate with, you know, your Fitbit yep. eventually and read your heart rate to know whether or not it needs to adjust based on your stress level when you're at work. And it can integrate with your calendar and know what time you're going to bed and kind of track that. And so it can start playing more calming music as you get towards your normal bedtime. I mean, this could be... This is the makings of something truly miraculous. Your life could be a musical and you would never that rather than you having to build a playlist for each occasion, Spotify could just seamlessly build the playlist of your life constantly. And the thing I think I'm I'm going to I'm going to talk about Apple a little bit here, but the thing I think is interesting is that whenever people talk about the Spotify Apple thing, they always talk about Spotify like Spotify is this, you know, young plucky <laughs> startup right, that yeah. That is, you know, taking on the man and Apple. And what people always forget is the fact that Americans couldn't wait for Spotify to come to the United States. That it got through its whole plucky startup, didn't know what it was doing thing. In Europe in, a long time in, ago. Yeah, in Europe. And so they just needed to get the deals in the U.S., which is currently the thing that Apple is trying to work out in the U.S., and so right now, Spotify is the, the player to beat in the streaming music market. And by adding things like video, which have higher, um, higher ad revenue, yep. they can actually possibly, instead of you know, all the rumors of Apple trying to kill that, that service, the free service, if people engage with videos on Spotify, then it makes it so that their, um, their free tier becomes more sustainable. And right now, uh, the, the statistic is something like 75% of their users are free tier users. Interesting. And they only generate 10% of the revenue. Fascinating. So by doing something that has higher um, ad revenue like video, you might be able to move that needle in the right direction. Hmm. And then offering, offering more than just, hey, you can listen to it without ads on a premium tier. Pulling yeah, this, is the, this playlist of your life technology that I have suggested. <laughs> right. So, something where I don't feel like the needle is going in the right direction. Uh, the fight over, you, over your data and privacy continued this week. The U.S. Department of Commerce proposed rules that would classify zero-day exploits, that is, security flaws in software that the software makers don't know about yet, as weapons. This would mean that security researchers could only could only kind of sell the identification of exploits um, with governments and companies within the Five Eyes Alliance, that is the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Security researchers tend to think this will leave, um, this will merely leave bug hunting outside of the alliance to either criminals, in the case of the U.S.'s enemies, or to non-Five Eyes-based firms, which sets up a weird competitive issue with you for U.S. firms. No matter what, it would probably weaken the security of our administration, which, as it turns out, the Five Eyes Alliance have already been doing. They used just this kind of zero-day exploit in Alibaba's UC internet browser to capture data from the app users in its both English and Chinese um, iterations. This is all according to a Snowden document right. provided to Canada's CBC by The Intercept. While, excuse me, um, so they discovered this vulnerability um, in in this most popular uh, kind of most popular internet browser outside of the pre-installed ones in an attempt to capture customer data through interchanges with app stores. Right. I couldn't. I. I didn't get – obviously, I don't have access to the unredacted documents. So it's a little hard to tell if this was something that came purposefully out of this or in examining all these things, they discovered that this app was wildly insecure. It, that's, that's a little unclear, at least to me. But either way, they were looking for – to capture data via communication with app stores. And what they found is, hey, this really popular <laughs> internet browser uh, is really easy to exploit. Um, it was sending user queries and device identifiers through an unencrypted channel. Oh, yeah. Whoops. Basically ex exposing, exposing millions of users around the world and apparently revealing some military secrets. <laughs> Naturally, the Five Eyes Alliance did not report this bug to Alibaba. Uh, big surprise. They, they thought they had the golden ticket. Um, 
all of this makes it no wonder that 164 tech companies, academics, and security researchers, including three of the five on Obama's special post-Snowden panel, issued a strongly worded statement this week to the Obama administration to not undermine encryption by insisting that the government have an accessible backdoor. The FBI and others within the administration have been blustering that end-to-end encryption, where the companies themselves cannot decrypt the data, is a problem, then they think that it's essential that the government be able to access this data, um, if it wants to. But, as the letter and these researchers point out, that's not how encryption (laughs) works. It's not how any of this works. If the U.S. government has a backdoor, Others will be able to find it. So eventually, Kim Jong-un will presumably be reading your email or something like that. So, Jimmy, what do you think of this idea of exploits as a weapon of war? I mean, it's concerning to me that something like a web browser's vulnerability could be discovered and then not not reported especially if so this in this case it was Alibaba right, but this is a Chinese company but I'm I'm going to use the classic example of a insecure web browser Internet Explorer 6.0 6. <laughs> um <laughs> IE6. IE6, also known as the worst web browser in history. Only because it, um, only because it stayed out there so long. Yeah, it, it was. It's the reason I, IE5 and IE6 are the reason that Firefox and Chrome exist. Mm-hmm. It was that bad. <laughs> yes. So, if you know, there there are such so many problems with that web browser, and yeah, Microsoft knew about a lot of them and was trying to fix a lot of them, but. The idea that this thing could be released and the Five Eyes Alliance, one of which is the U.S., mm-hmm. Microsoft being a U.S. company, and they, they'd they say, hey, look, there's a vulnerability. Let's not tell anybody except for our fellow, you know, security firm or security um, agencies. agencies, and we'll just collect all of the data. I mean – at some point, I think that the government has a responsibility not only to its people, but also to, well, its people, the companies. No, but so, but it's even weirder than that, right? So it's not even – so with the Commerce Department thing – and by the way, those rule changes are uh, up for review. So submit your comments. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is crazy. So if you t- factor in the Department of Commerce stuff, it's why I opened with that. So it's not just that the NSA will find a bug and exploit it, which presumably they've been doing for a long time. It's that if a U.S. security researcher finds a flaw in a French, outside the Five Eyes, so in a French product, they would have to get an export license in order to sell that information to the French company in order for the French company to fix their thing. What also creates this really weird situation where if you look at the Five Eyes Alliance, I mean, what about NATO? So this, yeah, again, this I mean, supersedes NATO. This most supersedes. of, um, yeah, I mean, we're spying. Look, we spy. Like we hacked Angela Merkel's phone. Like, oh, I, we spy on we spy on our allies, and they spy on us. Um, allies, whatever. We 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 spy on other countries with with which we have amicable um, relationships, aka like Germany and France and the UK, and well, no, we spy so, on everybody. So. Theoretically, including what, ourselves, it, theoretically, what the five eyes alliance means is, yes, the U.S. and U.K. are spying on each other, but they're sharing all that information theoretically. Mm-hmm. And th- that's the sense I get from the stone documents is, okay. is that that like, yes, we are spying on the U.K. in that they give us what they've got and we give them what they've what we've got. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that zero day exploits should be weapons. I, I understand I understand the idea. I understand the thought process that gets you to this point. I can see how you get here where you say, but this is a strategic advantage that we have found. Mm -hmm. If we can find an exploit that exists that is not patched, then it gives us another way to break into phones, computers, whatever. Mm -hmm. However, the thing that is really concerning to me is less the first thing and more the second thing that you talked about with the fact that 
the government has been pushing and specifically government agencies like the FBI have been pushing to have a back door. So basically to build an exploit into all encryption, which will just fundamentally break all encryption because if there's any organization that's leakier than the U S government, I'm not sure what it is. Right. What also means that, you know, guess what? So the bad guys aren't going to use any of that encryption. So all it means is it makes it easier to spy on you and me who don't, aren't really, you know, doing anything that we're trying to really encrypt real deeply. Right. And the people who really need to encrypt some stuff are going to, you know, develop their own things or go with, you know, Russian developed things or whatever. Like, they'll just, they're going to find a way. This is, you know, this is the internet, man. This is technology. And in the end, encryption is math. And so you can always make new math. You can make new encryption that the U.S. government doesn't have access to. And then it becomes an arms race. And so why deliberately break it when really all you're going to do is exploit... It's, it's In a weird way, it's like DRM or anything else, right? Right. Where it, it doesn't hurt the people who, who are, are trying following to, the rules. Who are follow, it hurts the people who are following the rules. It doesn't really affect the people who are breaking the rules because you build it within this ruled ecosystem and the rule breakers are over here going, I'm just going to download LimeWire. Right, exactly. Right. So... I think that I think that classifying exploits as weapons and then treating them like how we treat our distribution of, of, of weaponry to the world is is really dicey and it's really something to Yeah, but I wonder if it's also realistic. I, I, mean, I don't I don't like it perhaps. But it, they we've just seen like an exploit is a weapon of war. But we I think that's it. I think that the the concern for me is that is the fact that there is this alliance that is sure. outside of existing uh, tra treaty organizations. This should probably such as you. yes NATO, <laughs> because granted NATO doesn't have the counter power um, of the Warsaw Pact anymore. Um, however, NATO is still an important organization. Um, on an international military level. And it's part of the reason why we were able to go into some of these war zones and have people come with us is because of NATO, not because right. of the UN. And so the fact that on the next, arguably the next battlefront, we, are, we are removing some of our allies in NATO is possibly justified but also something something to be strongly considered before it's just done so recklessly but i think it's something we're already doing i mean again like oh like it's Five definitely Eyes something exists, we're, already, like we're doing. already doing it so i think the department of commerce thing is kind of just saying let's be realistic about this i think it's unnecessarily narrow that it's only five eyes, but at the same time, it's kind of a, a weird recognition of like, look, we're using all these exploits against the French and against the Germans and against the Spanish and against the whoever. So we're just going to codify this as rulemaking and hope no one notice notices. Or no one cares. Or no one cares. So perhaps more on the no one cares. Hey, uh, I care. I, I actually care too. Um, the fiber is rolling out slowly but surely out into um, northwest Georgia from Chattanooga. So I, I care quite a bit. There you go. So, um, Except not because well, again, I'm getting fiber in both the places I currently live just as I'm going to not live in either of those places. Congratulations. Yep. So while well, the uh, FCC is getting sued again, but this time it isn't by corporate America, well, at least not directly. Um, the Tar Heel State, the great state of North Carolina, has sued the FCC to allow the state to enforce a law limiting municipal broadband, a law the FCC preemptively overturned back in February. Um, so what, what, did, what, what happened was um, the city of Wilson, who, is cur who currently offers electricity in six counties in uh, kind of northern North Carolina, also known as like southern Virginia um, – and it also offers municipal broadband only in Wilson County, was prevented from expanding that broadband coverage to any area not already covered. Um, now, this was accomplished not explicitly like, no, you can't do that. More like, hey, you can do that, but you have to go through all this bureaucratic red tape and 
you know, do things like share your commercially sensitive information with any and all people that want it and include phantom costs to increase the cost of the service that they offer and blocking popular funding methods for like doing any of these things. Um, and this is so there's 19 states that have uh, rules around preventing municipal broadband from expanding and and basically existing systems are, are grandfathered in they're not applying these rules to existing systems which is why the count wilson county itself and chattanooga and tennessee both have been able to operate the way that they they have been operating without any problems but have had a lot of struggles in trying to expand their reach yeah oh, i trust um, in the middle of that struggle so what happened was the FCC then inserted themselves into this process earlier this year um, using – leveraging Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act hey, of 1996. Our good friend. Um, which gives the FCC the power to encourage the rollout of broadband and to remove any barriers to that rollout, uh, which it saw these laws as barriers. So North Carolina – is has filed their suit in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they're actually the second state to file a suit, the first being Tennessee around Chattanooga's expansion. Um, so Chattanooga, what, it hap- what happened was that Chattanooga and Wilson both had appealed to the FCC to kind of not strike down these state rules. Uh, Georgia also has rules against, um, similar rules yeah. against this. Um, So the North Carolina Attorney General, uh, Roy Cooper, stated that the FCC's action, quote, is arbitrary, capricious, and an abuse of discretion within the meaning of the Administrative Procedure Act and is otherwise contrary to law, end quote. So them's fighting words. Yeah. So, So Trey, do you think that the FCC has actually overstepped their bounds by inserting themselves between the state and its municipalities? That well, seems to be North Carolina's primary argument. Sure, of course it would, because they this don't is, want this thing. It, well, they don't, their lobbyists don't want this okay, thing. Okay, the lobbyists that run this don't want this thing. I think the this is literally the role of the federal government. You to kind of look at this logically, this is theoretically what the federal government does, right? It makes it so that you can kind of have battles between states and municipalities or in between states. And there's someone that can settle that. That's that's what that's what a federal government does. So I think that's why this goes straight to the Court of Appeals. That's why it goes straight to the Court of Appeals. So I think it's fascinating that someone's trying to go against competition. Now, the argument is always, no, this is, you know, the government... It's not a fair competition. It's not a fair competition. It's the government stepping in and quashing the competition. Whereas, the fact is, is like, competition currently does not exist. And and maybe, oddly, it does in Wilson, North Carolina, or did in Chattanooga, Tennessee. But I don't think it does. Right? I don't think that, you know... Well, especially Wilson, North Carolina. Chattanooga is a large enough city in its own right that there's a possibility that there may be broadband independent of their own municipal. But you know what happened when Google, every time Google's come in with gigabit fiber in a place, Comcast has magically realized that they can also offer gigabit or two gigabit in that same place. Well, yeah, and what, uh, but the thing that they've also discovered is that they have difficulty matching Google's price. And, and the thing that I think is really interesting about that is the fact that we have all these arguments against municipal internet, and one of the someone someone wrote into the Daily Tech News show and was saying something along the lines of, "Well, you know, but they they can't be monopolistic and they can't do this and they can't do that." And and the at the end of the day, they're not being monopolistic in most of these cases. They're providing a service. So the reason most of these groups are co-ops and they exist around cr- bringing electricity to. Um, more rural areas of the country. So, for example, um, there's we we did some work actually for a dairy co-op in um, eastern New Mexico, and it, it serves like a huge area of eastern New Mexico. And the only reason it exists is because there are all these dairy farmers that needed power, and no one was bringing it to them. And so they formed this co-op 
that was essentially a municipal group that then brought electricity to them. And then it's these same groups that are now turning around and saying, okay, well, we're not getting broadband and we need broadband in order to like exist. So we, we want to roll out broadband. And then this legislation is trying to prevent these groups that rolled out electricity, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago from doing anything else. But I think it's it's that's what broadband is. Broadband's the next step of that. Exactly. Well, and it's the, these, these groups popped up because the, the competitive market was not serving them because at the end of the day, rural America is such so spread out sure. that it does not make commercial sense in a lot of ways for those companies to move in because you know they'll they'll expend all of this money to lay all of this fiber for very little financial benefit. And Chattanooga is not a huge place either. No, I mean Chattanooga is like what a hundred thousand people, something like that. I mean it's a, compared to where I work, it's a good sized town, but it's you know it's not one of the major civic centers, right? No. I mean, it, it, it was only noteworthy because of all the rail yards. Yep. And, it, you know, and now it has the fiber equivalent of that. Thanks. To, yeah. Thanks, municipal broadband. And it is a, it's a point of pride for Chattanooga. They have these great bills. But welcome to Gig City, which just makes me want to cringe. But also it makes me think about, hey, you know, if my life was logistically different, I could just get an office in Chattanooga. Right. Well, and, and I think that I think that municipal broadband, theoretically, you should be able to as, as a company you should be able to operate um, some kind of a broadband service more inexpensively than a municipal broadband. Because guess what? Municipal broadband has higher overhead. <laughs> sure, and it's presumably going to make less profit. I think if the... And I, you know, I don't exactly know how um, EPB in Chattanooga or whatever it is in Wilson, I don't know how they're structured. But as long as it isn't creating a state-mandated monopoly, unlike what Comcast basically has, then sure, do it. If it is, if, if, if the deals aren't structured right, I think there is, although it seems, like I said, all of these things seem to be monopolies. They, I think there is an argument to be made that it shouldn't be monopolistic in how the deal is structured. But if that's not how the deal is structured, or if anyone can piggyback off their fiber or, or whatever that is, if it opens up the chance for competition, bring on the municipal broadband, at least someone's laying the darn fiber. Because well, Verizon, I'm, remember, at one point, Verizon just sort of stops like, look, Fios just isn't making us enough money. We're just going to kind of stop laying that fiber thing. Well, the, uh, Verizon went, it's not worth it. Right. And so Google has come back in and said, no, it is worth it. And Google, to their credit, is one of the biggest drivers of uh, gigabit internet in the U.S., I mean, period. They made, it, they made it a household idea. They, they made it as the, like, you should be able to get gigabit internet for $70 a month. Yeah. You should be able to do that. I would pay $70. I'm paying currently paying $61 a month well, and if for I, five megs down. And if I remember, yeah, well, that's ridiculous. And people um, half mile away who are starting to get Chattanooga's gigabit internet, internet are getting fiber run very near where I live and work uh, are paying that same kind of money for gigabit. I mean, that's the... That's, you know, right now, all I have is really terrible DSL. I can't get cable. There's no cable lines run out to here. Well, but because of Chattanooga's <laughs> municipal internet, we're starting to get that fiber laid right where we are. Well, and the other thing is that Google is pushing all of the cable stuff over the fiber. Right. So Which they're feeding the it all. Th- doing anyways. Yeah, I mean, the last mile is coax, but the rest of it's all fiber. Um, which is the problem actually. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, I think the combination of municipal and Google are, are pushing the market forward and shutting off municipal as, as a viable option for especially small communities is just, um, widening the digital divide. Yeah. Right. So I think that there's a market to be made. Comcast or Google would already be there. The the other thing, I'll, the, my my closing comment on this is th- th- what F- the FCC did was specifically um, was basically told to them, hey, if you want to do this, this is what you have to do. In um, one of the court hearings yeah, yeah, they I had, 
uh, do, back in 2014. I do, I do actually remember that. They remember said you have to use the 706 Telecommunications Act, um, but if you use that, then you can overturn uh, b- these bans on municipal wi- or municipal internet. So speaking of things that are going to get that have been overturned, so maybe uh, is this win- a rock? <laughs> the, so maybe the winter, and by that I mean the Apple TV, isn't coming a- after all. Sad day. The uh, Wall Street Journal report uh, issued a report this week that uh, while Apple had been planning and working on a TV to be released in 2016, it shelved the product and reinsi- reassigned the workforce about a year ago after the TV failed to impress. They are working on a 4K TV with cameras and sensors and the ability to use FaceTime. Uh, but it seems as though they didn't think it would make enough of a dent in a crowded TV market. Plus, I've never met a camera-enabled sensor TV I liked. <laughs> I, you know, I was, so I was, let's get back to my intro in a second. Uh, but I was just reading, the minute I had packed with sensors and cameras, <laughs> I just remember standing in that Samsung booth at CES 2012. No, it was LG. LG. It was LG. It was LG. You're and, holding your finger. And You're I holding was supposed it to wrong. hold my arm um, up like I was raising my hand with my finger pointing in the air. And I was doing that, and apparently I wasn't achieving the precise angle that this sensor needed. And it was like, oh, no, you're doing it wrong. It's like it was literally – it was just supposed to be the simple motion. It's supposed to be simple and seamless. And I have – none of them have – I mean, the Connect isn't either. I mean, none of these things are. But maybe Apple – um... Maybe Apple could have done it better. Mm. Carl I can, my favorite investor, still <laughs> thinks they can. He released a note on Monday claiming that Apple should put out a TV next year and a car in 2020 to open up a potentially $2.2 trillion market or something. And also buy stock. That's great, Carl. Are you with Carl? I think he's crazy. Of course Carl's crazy. But this has been my my position all along. Um, I think it's interesting that we've now found out something about this TV that was mythical and was supposed to be coming. Uh, but I fully agree with the decision because the I, reading the report basically was that it was a pr- it was developed and a prototype was a prototype was developed and it was presented to the executives and the executives said I'm sorry there's just not enough there yeah and I think that that was the right decision because you look at all of the whiz bang stuff that Samsung and LG and everyone has been doing in their TVs and you know what nobody cares. Well, because it was look, it was all awful. Right? Apple can make much better margins on a box this big that they sell you lots of content through, and that you can iterate easily. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about this before. There's a lot of issues in jump being Apple and jumping into the TV market. It functions more like the laptop market, which they still make money on, but again, not that kind of gangbusters because you don't replace it that often. Apple makes a lot of its money, not just the fact that it makes crazy margins on each device, but that you replace that device fairly frequently. This results in a lot of money, right? Right. TVs, you keep them like five to eight years. And that's great because you plunk down a lot of money and you get a decent TV and then it lasts. And it's like an appliance. In fact, it is an appliance. It's actually an appliance. I'm not arguing that we should be iterating, buying more televisions. In fact, I kind of like the stability of the TV market. And I get annoyed that the TV marketers keep trying to get me to buy a TV with whiz bang BS that is meaningless. Like, oh, you can raise your finger and interact with the television, except it doesn't work. Voice is the only thing that makes sense on a television. Right. But I would much rather have a box that I hook up to my television, and my television is a dumb display. So then all I'm worried about with my television is display technology, which doesn't rev all that often. Rather than being worried about display technology and processor speed and sensor tech, that all of that is going to, because that market is transforming so rapidly, unlike display technology, all of that's meaningless one to two years later. And by the time you get rid of your television, you may have apps relating to services that no longer exist. Right. For instance. Like Voodoo. Like Voodoo. I'm sure there are people with Voodoo still on their televisions. Right. 
or some of the aspects of Google TV, which is now a totally deprecated product. But you probably still have your TV with that integrated. So I, this is there were not that many of those, to be fair. But the, but that's but my point is, you get a dumb, you get a box that's smart and a display that's dumb. Now it's hard to buy just a straight up dumb display at this point because they want to add on these whiz bang features. Well, to check and up the price. Well, what you do is you just buy a Vizio and then you buy a Roku or an Apple TV or an Amazon Xbox Fire or TV an Xbox or an Xbox One or PS4 if you're you know if you're on the gaming end of things. You buy a box that connects to it. Well, you're not going to rev those that often, but like with something like in the hundred dollars or less price price point, you could theoretically, if something new came out. So, for example, the Amazon Fire TV's main thing is that it's faster than the other things that are out there. So, if you had a you know Roku that was a couple years old and the Amazon Fire TV came out, you could buy that and not feel bad because it's only a hundred bucks. It's not you know like you're throwing away your TV and starting over. Right. And we've talked about it before on the show that, you know, Samsung with the guts you could replace, but even that's a kludge. Why not just get something you know is going to be supported that is a focus for that company and use that? So Roku or even the game systems, you know, these game systems are going to be supported for X amount of time. You don't know if your smart TV, which is just an add on stupid whiz bang feature and not the core business of that company is going to be supported. And it was bad to start with Xbox, although some people thought was bad to start with, has gotten a heck of a lot better. Oh, yeah. And connect st- works better than that stupid LG head and shoulders, knees and toes thing. It doesn't work great, but the voice works works well. Oh, yeah, and the voice is the way that this stuff has gone. But I, I definitely think that Apple made the right decision um, if, in fact, they did shelve the TV. and uh, Or this is all a big you know, ploy by them to leak oh, this God. out. With, and oh, see, God. I, and see, mm. okay, what do people think? Do people agree? I agree. Kill it. it no. you, you, there's no what market if this is, sense. What if this is a ruse? And because WWDC is coming, and we know we're going to get an Apple TV announcement there, right? We know that. Uh, that's pretty certain that the Apple TV is going to become the hub. All of this is coming out because it, Apple leaked this week that basically the Apple TV is going to become the hub of your smart home. And that's what they're going to release a new device, a new Apple TV, little hockey puck thing. And it's going to be now presumably. the hub for your smart uh, Presumably. It's going to become the hub for your smart home. What if this is a ruse and the one more thing is, oh, yeah, no, we did do the TV and here it is. I, I think that would be a mistake. I think, uh, yes, but I would love to watch that. <laughs> it would fun. be hilarious, though. Yeah. Would it be a mistake? Absolutely. But it would also be awesome. I, yes. Yes. Apple I, TV, a mistake, but awesome. A mistake, but awesome. And now time for this week's last call. <laughs> So, I'd like to announce that at POTUS is on the Twitters. So, that's right. The office of the President of the United States, or POTUS for short. That's become a thing. And also SCOTUS, Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. And FLOTUS. Um, First Lady. Yep. Uh, so the office of the president of the United States has gotten its own Twitter handle. According And according to the White House press office, it's actually going to be used by President Obama as opposed to at Barack Obama, which is managed by members of his staff. <laughs> um, every so often he does post things himself and he always signs them with his initials. Um, so that, that way you know he's the one that actually posted it. But that's also how you know that he is not the one that posts most of the stuff. <laughs> um, so... There are not many tweets yet, only four total, uh, including one response to Bill Clinton about whether the handle comes with the office, to which Obama said, quote, good question, at Bill Clinton. The handle comes with the house. Know anyone interested in at Flotus? Because <laughs> that, that is Michelle's Twitter. That is Michelle. I clicked on it. That is Michelle's um, Twitter. <laughs> Uh, his first post was after something along the lines of, after six years, they finally trust me with Twitter. <laughs> Did they Here, me, finally give him a Blackberry, too? Let me pull it up. Uh, it says, uh, oh, it only shows three of the four. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hello, Twitter. It's Barack. Really? Six years in, they're finally giving me my own account. <laughs> God. Lame duck presidents have too much time on their hands sometimes. <laughs> 
So Trey, have have we reached the pinnacle of free speech and it's all downhill from here? Look, I think this is a strange <laughs> admission that he hasn't been the one <laughs> tweeting That's his been... own name for years. I, I there was a, a long running joke in the tech press this week of like and trying to, people speculating about Bill Clinton's question, and I'm glad. Um, Brock answered it that yes, no. So the next president's going to get it. What I want to look for is who does the next president unfollow from who Barack Obama is following, and who do they follow? Because I think it can. St- it's me another thing that we as you know my undergraduate was in political science that we as you know political junkies can look at to really understand the tone being set by the administration by the presidency. Yep. So. If, you you want to express your uh, uh, free speech and write into this show podcast textlastcall dot com facebook dot com slash textlastcall pinterest dot com slash textlastcall or at textlastcall on the twitters how you find us we'll be seeing you on the interwebs. <laughs> I almost made a West Wing joke. What joke? I don't know. I was I was writing the POTUS intro while I was watching West Wing. No. You're, tell your friend he has a strange name. Exactly. It's not his name. It's his job. President of the United States. You, you too, can have a strange name. I you wonder too. if that's the moment where we all realized what the is. Yeah, no, I think that that is. It seems super inside baseball-y. <laughs>